Is it sound all right? Yeah, OK. I guess so. OK, lots of people. I guess uh, RMS didn't sing the free software song. I was a bit afraid that everybody will run away. Um, but uh, sorry about that. There were some problems with the, um, with this. Um, no, I don't have network yet. They are, have gone through for a network cable, so I can demo some of the distributed stuff. Uh, let me start the presentation. Um, Can you bring me the other US, the other mouse? This one doesn't work. Well, anyway, uh, I can use the built-in one, but it just sucks. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Um, okay, it works. Um, well, I'm going to talk about Plan 9. I guess most of you already know what Plan 9 is. Uh, but I'm going to give a short introduction first. And uh, well, first of all, talk about what most people ask about Plan 9, uh, which is, uh, well, is Plan 9 open source? Because for many years, it was not open source, and it was not free software, whatever your uh, political tendency is. Uh, well, yes, Plan 9 and Inferno, which I will not speak about today, uh, but it's also closely related to Plan 9, are open source and they are free software. Uh, a few years ago, the license was changed. RMS, which I think is not around anymore, uh, said that then it was all right. The open source initiative said that it was all right. And the Debian project actually packages some of the Debian source code. So it's also free according to the Debian free software guidelines. Uh, we in Plan 9 don't like to talk about licenses. Uh, well, we only prefer to talk about code and about technical stuff. So we are a bit, after so many years, the people is a bit sensible. But well, I, I hope everybody should be happy you now that it's under a free server license. OK. Um, this, I guess, is the most important uh, of the whole presentation. Uh, Jim Thewinsky asked once, what's the most important thing about a project? Uh, so, uh, I think we have a pretty good answer for Plan 9. Uh, well, uh, I guess, I, I think it's a very cute mascot. I don't know how, what other people, are, if other people agree, but I think it's much better than a fat penguin or uh, some sort of demon or something. Uh, but well, I hope people find it useful. OK, some history. Uh, Plan 9 was started in the mid-80s mid by the same people that did Unix in the 70s and 60s, well, late 60s. And uh, it was first used, uh, that's another common question. People say, so it's Plan 9 finished. This is, uh, can people use it? Well, in Bell Labs, it has been used since 1980 and, and since 1989 uh, in a production environment by quite a few hundreds of people. Uh, the problem is that they are pretty quiet about it, but uh, they use it. And uh, yeah, well, it has been used since then. And today, it's also used. Other organizations use it too. Um, it's used at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. They use it for clustering and so on. Uh, it's used at various universities and, well, some small companies use it too. Um, Planet has had uh, four public releases, major releases. Uh, they are not very common, but, well, the first one was in 93, but only to universities. Then the second edition was still proprietary in 95, and you had to pay for it. Uh, and then in, 3000, in 2000 was the first source code release. Um, and then it was, in 2002, was under this new open source uh, license, which was accepted for everybody. Uh, there is also Inferno, which is sort of the sister s system from Plan 9. Um, Inferno uh, is quite different, but it uses some of the same ideas. and. Uh, they have many things in common, and they use the same technologies. I will not speak very much about Inferno, but uh, I think 
people should also look into it. It's also open source, it's under a GPL and MIT license, and um, it's very interesting. It also uses a different language, it's not in C. Uh, well, parts of it is written in C, but uh, uses the Limbo programming language, which is uh, rather interesting. Uh, okay, what about Plan 9 today? Uh, well, uh, most people think it's dead. I have heard many people say it, but, but it's not really. I mean, every day there is changes to the source tree, and uh, the ISO that you can install and boot from, it's not only a, a installer, you can also boot it without installing it in your hard disk directly. From, um, it's rebuilt every day from the latest sources. So you can go to 9fans.net, and there you can download it. It's 80 megabytes compressed. So, well, I think if you compare with uh, some late recent Linux distributions that are like uh, a few DVDs or something, I think there's a small size difference. Um, and then there is like a system to retrieve updates to your running system uh, to update your source code directly from the, mm, what it's called sources. Sources is like the main repository of uh, the source code at Bell Labs. Uh, and any user can send patches using a patch management system uh, called patch. Uh, slightly confusing with uh, the Unix patch. There's many things in Plan 9 that are somewhat confusing because they have nothing to do. Uh, so you can create patches and you can send them into the queue and somebody will look at them and say, oh, this is all right, and put it into the main system or not. Uh, and then there is uh, end sources country, which is if you write something for Plan 9 but doesn't fit into the main distribution or you port some software or whatever, anybody can get a directory there and put any random code that you can come up with and you can find also lots of contributed documentation and contributed programs and so on. Mm. So that's also interesting. Uh, okay, some more, more older background. I guess everybody knows about Multics, but I wonder I guess nobody has ever used it uh, here. Well, not me either. Uh, well, because it sort of was, was a great system, but it was a bit too complicated. Uh, so in the late 60s, uh, Multix was started and was going to be the next big operating system that was going to be useful for everything, and it was going to be able to do everything and so on. Uh, but well, it became too big, too complex, and in the end, just failed completely. Uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, which uh, were at Bell Labs at the time, were part of the project, and uh, well, when they failed, they had nothing to do. Uh, so they went to play with a PDP-7, and well, we everybody knows what happened next. Uh, Unix was born. But what was different from Unix to Multics? They all had mon lots of things in common. Uh, but they had a big difference, that Unix was much, much simpler than uh, Multics. Um, Unix took some of the ideas of Multics. Uh, many, almost all the concepts that you can find in Unix, uh, you could find them in, in Multics, like hierarchical file system, uh, like uh, even pipes existed, um, if I remember correctly, in some form of, uh, what they, I think it was called data channels. Uh, they existed in, in Multics, but the problem is that to do what uh, you do in a single line, like uh, cat foo, pipe into grep, uh, pipe into sort, you had to um, write like 10 lines of code that set up the channel and then um, used it, and the programs had to be especially designed to talk to each other and so on. So Unix came up with a much simpler and cleaner way to do it. Um, and well, and then there is the idea of one uh, program to do one thing well, which actually that was pretty new in, plan, in uh, Unix. Uh, and text as a universal language, text everywhere. All, all applications speak text. They print text and they understand input as text. And that way, all uh, programs can talk together even if they sign to in, originally to work together. That, there's lots of ways you could build powerful uh, combinations. Uh, and well, that was pretty new at the time, writing in a high level language. Okay, th all these Unix had in 1970s, okay? Uh, but today, uh, Unix has some of these things, but others are a bit lost. Like, um, each tool to do one thing well, I mean, it's like you have networking into Bash and uh, that kind of uh, really useful features. And then you have uh, networking built into AUK and networking built into CAT. Oh no, I think uh, GNU or CAT doesn't have that yet. Maybe. Um, I don't keep track of all the dash dash 
blah, blah, blah options. Maybe in the man page. Oh, no, in the info page, sorry. Um, so what other problems? I mean, many of these things are still true, but has not changed very much. So why was uh, Plan 9 started by the same people that created Unix? Well, in the, during the 80s, well, Unix started to grow and grow and get more complex, so it was not simple anymore. And uh, also it started to, like, the people in California doing LSD, they started to add, like, sockets and a uh, bunch of other stuff like that. So that, that started to make problems. And, and the thing is that Unix was not designed to, to work in a network time environment. It, Unix was decided, designed as a time-sharing system where all the users were in a single system and where all the resources were in a single place. And uh, you access them more or less in the same way, but uh, in a centralized place. Mm, and it was not designed for graphics either, and it was not designed for lots of things that have happened in the last 30 years. But lots of people just went and attached them on the side uh, of Unix well, maybe with quite a bit of thought, but uh, without following the Unix principles. So, um, and it's still, well, in Unix, things don't work as well as they could. Um, and there's lots of accumula accumulated stuff. I will talk a bit about uh, what the stuff has accumulated in, in Unix, uh, which the people that developed Unix thought it was time to get rid of. And, the most important with all these people adding stuff is that it was a loss of conceptual integrity. Uh, and this is something uh, that Fred Brooks wrote about in a mythical man month, which I hope everybody has read. It's one of the most important computer science books. Uh, and uh, conceptual integrity of a system is very important because it's what it makes it consistent and what makes all the parts of the system possible to understand and what you know about one part of the system be possible to apply to another part of the system. And in Unix, that has been lost by adding all these things from other systems and all these hacks to, to adapt it to the network and to other new things. Uh, so Unix is not very simple anymore. And uh, well, if you just look at the GCC man page or something like that, you will notice that it has got a bit complicated. Um, so here's a list of things that Plan 9 does not have. Um, this is very important because, um, well, it's important, I think, that people don't get wrong expectations. Plan 9 is similar to Unix in many ways. It was developed by the same people at the same place, but is not the same as people expect today of, um, of Unix. All these things, we don't have them, and we don't have them because, in our opinion, we don't need them. Uh, I will explain later. Well, there is things like root, which, and SUAD, which, well, maybe at the time, seemed like a really great idea, but today it's a security enigma. Uh, TTI courses, things designed for an era of uh, hard copy terminals and thing, things like that. IOCTL, a horrible hack to be able to f fit all kinds of uh, stuff through a single uh, device file. Sockets, well, sockets, well, they work, but they don't fit into the Unix model. Uh, of files and, and so on. It, they have a pretty weird interface compared with the kind of interfaces in, in other previous Unix systems. Select and poll, anybody that knows a bit about their implementation in the kernel, they are pretty messed up. And uh, some links, uh, another, they destroy the semantics, the, the simple, the originally really simple file system semantics with sim links sort of go to hell and lots of problems. Well, anyway, I could go on try talking about lots of them for quite a while. Um, well, C++, well, if you like C++, fine. Maybe you are, uh, have an IQ of 1,000 or something. But uh, I don't think I know anybody that understands C++. So it does, doesn't follow very much the uh, Unix philosophy of simplicity and so on. Um, actually, some of these things, there are uh, you can have them in Plan 9, but don't expect them because, uh, well, maybe somebody ported GCC because they really needed some, uh, somebody at Bell Labs some years ago ported GCC uh, because they needed a C++ application to run uh, for some scientific project or whatever. And they ported it, but, uh, well, I, don't, I have never heard of anybody else using it, and this guy that did the port died, so, well, I don't know if there is a connection between people in Plan 9 not liking C++, but, well, uh, I never heard of anybody else using it, so uh, that will give you an idea. Um, MX and VI, well, we have other kinds of text editors, so uh, 
they have never been very popular. X11, XML, well, I think these days Unix people likes very much Mac OS X. I really cannot believe it. I mean, it's like they're in the scripts are writing in XML. What were they thinking? Uh, and well I, well, I had put originally boost word camp land, but uh, well, web 2.0 seems to be the fashion word this week. So no, we don't have web 2.0 or anything like that, and we will never have, uh, so don't worry about that. Well, if you like it, I'm sorry. Uh, mm. So plan 9 is a completely new system. That's something that it's very uncommon. And there are very few systems in the last 30 years that are completely new. Everything, the kernel, the compilers, the libraries, the user interface. I mean, you, you see people working in whatever project and they use like, oh, well, we use GCC because, well, writing a new compiler is lots of work. Um, yeah, but GCC is not that great either, uh, especially if you ask uh, some of the BSD people, they are not all that happy and, uh, well, it, it's really fun when like it produces broken code and then you have to figure out if it's a bug in your program or it's just that you hit the wrong uh, optimization flags. Uh, there is a, I think there's a sport based on this. It's called Gentoo or something. Um, when we really rather spend the time doing other things. Uh, so um, Ken Tom, uh, the Plan 9 compilers, and um, they are, well, we really like them. They are nice. Um, new user interface, also designed to fit together with the new technologies and new input devices and new uh, display devices. Um, and back to have some um, consistency in the system, some, some way to all the pieces, all these piece, different pieces to be thought to work together rather than just be smashed together and taken from there or whatever. Mm. So it's back to, in, in a way, it's back to the Unix roots. And many things that are in Plan 9, they are almost the same as in the original Unix, uh, and they are, that they are different with current Unixes, and it's because, well, many people thought that, well, the way they are done today is not that great, or it's maybe too complex. Uh, so when you look at Plan 9, don't think of it as another Unix, because then you will get disappointed. You, you will expect things to work in a way, and you will not find that. You will not find BI. You will not find uh, all the GCC options, and you will not find a million of things that, uh, that just are not there, but it's because they are not supposed to be there. Uh, because, well, it was designed to work in a different way. It's not that, uh, well, if other people like them, fine, but uh, uh, Plan 9 is about solving these problems in a different way. Uh, so. Uh, what are Plan 9 took three, diff three ideas and build the whole system on top of them. Uh, they are slightly based on the ideas of Unix. Um, the idea of everything is a file. In Unix, everything was a file, except, well, some files were slightly different to special, uh, like uh, device files or sim links or, and so on. Um, so now in Plan 9, all the files are exactly the same, and all the files you can make the same operations of them. No ISTL, no backdoors into the brain of the kernel used through a file or whatever. No, it has to explicitly read, write, open, remove, that's it. Um, so, and actually many things are thought more as a file tree than as a single file. Because it makes it quite hard if you have to fit a whole device through a single file, that's why you have ISTL because you just read and write in a single file doesn't give you the range of operations that you want to make in a complex device, like a, a screen or like a, almost anything, actually. Um, so um, that's the idea that things are a file tree, and you can have different files that will give you a total interface to all the uh, workings of the interface you want to export, but all the components are files, and all the components work as files, and all the files work the same and have the same operations. Uh, then we take these files, and we have a file system protocol that works transparently over the network. Uh, a very simple protocol to do these kinds of operations that we have defined for files. Um, and that works both locally, remotely, uh, and, and for all these files. Um, this is the 9P protocol, and, and that's what gives you the network transparency to all resources, not just to the ones that are designed to have a specific protocol. And, and locally, you access the resources over 9P. Remotely, you access the resources over 9P. Everywhere, you use 9P to access the, um, the different resources. Um, 
And once you have these two things, you have a third thing that puts the whole idea together, which is the private namespaces. Um, this is uh, something that some people have uh, had a bit of a problem getting their mind around, which is a bit, because it works pretty different from other systems. A private namespace is every process can, not necessarily, they can share a namespace, but um, every process has its own view of all these resources. Because if you have a huge network or a set of networks, you cannot impose the same view on, on every user because they are not interested in seeing everything. Maybe they're interested in mounting the IP stack from the uh, firewall, but they are not interested on in mounting the um, graphics from the firewall, which is not a very powerful machine or something. Uh, so the private namespace not only gives it at the machine level, but also at the process level. That gives you security and that gives you, um, it has lots of advantages. I, we will see it later, but it lets you work. You can have a window with a view of the network and you can have another window with another view. And, and that's, it's used everywhere by, um, by providing these different namespaces to different applications. The, the, another of the main reasons is that there is lots of conventions. Applications expect to find the keyboard in its last dev cons. But that can come from one place or another, and sometimes you want it to come from one place, sometimes you want it to come to another, but you don't want all the applications to see the same keyboard. You want it to be able to be different. Mm, so okay, uh, connecting with that. What resources are, are file systems? Well, almost everything, um, except fork and memory allocation, everything else basically is uh, probably miss something, but anyway. Uh, networking, authentication, encryption, graphics, window system, uh, process control, it's also done through the file system. And there is a proc file system in, in, in many Unixes, but in, in Plan 9 is the only way to do process control. If you want to kill a process, you have to write kill into the control file uh, for that process. Um, there is no, that reduces a lot the, of the complexity and the number of syscalls that you have to have. Um, Ember environment is also a file system. The mail file system, which is um, which parses a mailbox and gives you a, a hierarchical view, that simplifies very much the writing of, for example, mail clients because it handles all the uh, mime mm, crap and so on. So the uh, file cl uh, mail client gets very simplified. Then boring stuff that you can see in some other systems like a CD file system, web file system, tar file system, FTP file system. Um, well, CD file system is somewhat interesting because yeah, you, if you want to burn a CD, you just copy the file into the right directory and they get burned there. Uh, so um, that's somewhat different. I mean, it's like this horrible drag and drop, whatever, but you can do it in the Unix way, use CP instead of having a huge interface on top of it to do it. Um, Okay, the 9P protocol. This is the protocol that links everything together. It's very lightweight compared with other uh, network protocols uh, like NFS. Oh, I forgot to AFS, under FS, uh, but well, I think it's pretty complicated having in mind that uh, use for authentication includes like uh, care bearers just into the implementation or something like that, I don't know. Um, anyway, it's much, much simpler uh, than all these other file systems. Uh, network file systems. Um, only three, 13 messages, um, byte oriented, can run over any transport. It has been implemented over all these and a few more. Um, TCP IL is a transport on top of IP that was developed especially for Plan 9 uh, at Bell Labs. It's used only in local networks um, because uh, to reduce even lower overhead than TCP for new connections and so on. Uh, but it doesn't do all the fancy um, stuff that TCP does. So it works great for local networks, not for over the net. But you can, th th that's another thing which I will show later. It doesn't really matter which of these transports you use because it's going to work the same. All the applications are not going to notice anything. So it's good to have different options. Um, and is that it's used for local, remote, uh, synthetic, and physical files. All files, you don't need, it's like a, anybody that has tried to do a, a netboot uh, setup in Unix, well, it can be made to work, but it's a bit of a pain in Plan 9 because all these are 
the same local and remote. It just works. Um, authentication and encryption also. Uh, not built into the protocol, but the protocol designed to handle any form of authentication. Uh, so you can use any authentication system. I will talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and encryption. Uh, also, the applications don't have to care how you are encrypting and how you are authenticating the connection. Um, and design for caching and stacking. So you can stack different uh, file system on top of another and so you can have cache um, of the file system. Um, okay, let's see what. I'm sorry, maybe I'm talking a bit too fast. Okay. And the namespaces. <clears throat> uh, there is three operations to handle namespaces. Uh, yeah, well, that's, once you get used to private namespaces, it really feels really natural. And it feels very awkward to have to, when you do a mount and you override something elsewhere that everybody gets to see it. And uh, well, that's not, sometimes not a problem, but sometimes it is. Uh, but it's more annoying that you cannot customize your view of the system to whatever you find convenient right now and then in any way you like. Uh, I think actually in Linux uh, they have implemented a form of private namespaces, but they have a problem uh, that if they let users change um, mount stuff, well, all this two idea stuff breaks because uh, Pass, you, you could mount something in a slash ATC and uh, then put any different password file and then run uh, su and then it will be really happy. Uh, that's a big problem, in, in, but will, because we don't have root and su ID, we don't care. And in plan nine is everything designed to be able to customize your namespace and actually makes things much more secure because uh, if you cannot see it, you cannot touch it. Uh, so, uh, and because all resources are files, if you have a private namespace and you mount your passwords, there, nobody's going to be able to see it in any way whatsoever, no matter what they do. Um, so there are three uh, main file system uh, namespace uh, operations. Bind. Bind takes one uh, path and throws it in another. Uh, it's used mostly for union file systems, but also I mean, it's used for a lot, but it lets you that's mostly for customizing, because it doesn't add anything to your existing namespace, but makes visible a file in a different point from where it was before. Uh, it's, you, you couldn't think about it as, as a symlink, but it's not in the file system. The file system doesn't know anything at all about bind. And uh, it's also not permanent. It's only associated with the namespace. Uh, that has a set of advantages, but I will not get to it now. Mount, uh, mount is what lets you add stuff into your namespace. You take a file descriptor, a file descriptor over which you talk 9P, and um, say where you want that file descriptor. That, the, the 9P connection is going to open into a whole file tree, right? So you mount it somewhere, and in that place in, the, in your namespace, all this uh, tree will show up. Um, okay, then there is a feed and a name, which uh, is what is used for authentication. Uh, that, I will explain a little bit later, but it's a bit more uh, complicated. But the thing is that mount, if you don't want authentication, you just pass minus one as the uh, authentication file, descript file descriptor and you're all right. Uh, but usually the application doesn't care. I will explain a bit later. Mm, and then unmount. Uh, here there's a big difference. They added an N. Uh, so you always will remember it's not unmount, it's unmount. Uh, and uh, well, that just removes something from your namespace that you uh, changed before. Okay, let's see if I can demo something. Uh, I, if somebody can bring me a mouse that works, it will be really nice. Um, a USB mouse? Oh, I left mine up there. And the, the, the Plan 9 people, they are not very friendly. So just if you get into the uh, Plan 9 community, you have to be aware of this. We are a bit nasty. So well, you see, they, they thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Ah, oh, well, thanks. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, I don't know how much time I have. 
Uh, let me see. 20 minutes, okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. I don't know what's wrong with this mouse. Oh, oh my god. Sorry. I hope that's all right. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, well, the USB doesn't want to, the USB mouse doesn't want to work, I don't know why. Anyway, uh, I can use this stupid built-in one. Um, and that's a problem with Plan 9 also, it's designed to use a mouse. That's a very big difference from, from Unix uh, and many old Unix people because, yeah, you have to use a mouse. I will try to show it with the built-in mouse. It's still quite useful. Uh, okay, this is the source code for my slides, of course, in trough. Um, and uh, what was what I was going to show? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, here you're also seeing the blooming system, which is any string anywhere. You can bloom it by right-clicking it in Acme. Acme is this text editor and development environment. And uh, it will do something supposedly smart with it, in which case this is a source file. It will just open it in the text editor. Here's an example of using uh, mount. Uh, this is how you open a new window in the window system. What you do is you have a uh, environment variable which defines where you can find the the window system running and uh, you mount the file descriptor well here it just uh, checks for it otherwise it does the default and so on and but well this is the line that matters it mounts into a slash dev a new uh, a new instance a new attach, a same file system is exported of ni over 9p can be attached many times. In the case of the window system, for example, it exports a new window. Every time you attach, it creates a new window and uh, you can play around with it. Uh, let me see if I can see this. Uh, yeah, for example, if we, if I open a new terminal here and uh, mount, uh, Um, the slash n will automatically create endpoints dynamically and uh, new. Uh, okay, it creates a new window, but it's an empty window because no process is running in it. Um, okay, but it instead of the default to create a new uh, window as you said before, saw before, which is to uh, mount it in slash dev. Uh, this time I mounted it into nfoo. So here you can see the file system exported by this window here, uh, or, or the file system that controls this window here. So if I uh, write uh, into uh, cons, it will show up there. Um, I can also do rc is the shell, and like this, and I do ls, it will display in the other place. Uh, because now the input of this is connected to the shell here. Uh, okay, you can do a bunch of cool stuff like that. Uh, but what this shows you is that uh, when you attach, it creates a new file tree and you can put it anywhere you like. And that's how you talk and manipulate this file, this, uh, and I think, Okay, well, now we can delete them. And we can go back here. Uh, sorry. Uh, oops. I think we were, 
Okay, well, sorry if this was not a very good demo, but anyway. Uh, when, when you mount, you have three options, um, which is you can mount overriding the previous uh, mount point, so what was there just goes away and disappears, uh, or you can mount before or after uh, what is already there. That creates union mount points, which are slightly or considerably different from BSD mount point, uh, union mounts, uh, aside from everybody can do them. And uh, the first, if you mount it before, then the files will show up first. So if you try to open a file, it will go through the stack of mounted file system and set that, that mount point and pick up the first one with that name. And then there's an extra flag, which if you set it, the first file system uh, mounted there, which has this mcreate uh, mount flag, uh, new files will get created there. Uh, that's pretty useful, for example, if you want to compile uh, something in a directory where you don't have permissions for, uh, you bind your slash TMP into that directory and uh, give it the create flag, and then you do mk and uh, just builds. Um, oh, okay, another. To see another thing that it's used uh, for is if I do ns, displays my current namespace in this uh, window. And uh, if I do ns grab bin, you will see here that I have a bunch of stuff, of different stuff bind under slash bin. Uh, in plan nine, there is no path. Well, there is, but it's not used really. And uh, it, everything, all the executables are bound into slash bin, so you can always find them there. Uh, the only thing is that they are Mm, mounted there dynamically into a union mount. Uh, the advantage, why you do this? Because if you CPU, if you connect to a different server, uh, it will change the namespace by, instead of here it says 386, uh, here this is the 386 binaries, RC is the shell, this is the shell scripts, they're always there. But the 386 stuff will be replaced by whatever other architecture. Uh, so you can execute comments remotely, uh, even uh, if they are uh, even if you are connecting to a different architecture uh, computer, because it will pick up the right binaries for, for that architecture. Okay, okay the kernel. Uh, well, I was trying to check yesterday how many IOCTLs the Linux kernel has. I could not figure out. I don't think anybody knows. Um, but uh, the last number I found, which was from one dot something, uh, was over 400. I guess there are quite a few more now. Well, it has over, over 300 syscalls and, well, a few lines of code. And other Unix systems like Solaris, or maybe, I think uh, the DTrace guy is coming after me, uh, has a few more. In Plan 9, we only have 37 syscalls. And for example, there is nothing related to networking, which is rather peculiar if you have in mind that it's a distributed system and that everything can work over the network. But precisely because there are no syscalls related to it, it means that everything can go over the network. Uh, and no IOCTL, and well, uh, a little less code. Um, of course, the comparison is not fair because drivers and so on, but we got quite a few drivers and a number of architectures. It's a few less, but we support quite a few architectures too. Uh, and a portion also between drivers and, and generic code is more or less similar. So I think it's a, it's a good comparison. Um, it, there has an optional real-time scheduler. Uh, Microkernel or monolithic kernel? Everybody asks, oh, is Plan 9 a monolithic a microkernel? Well, I thought the fashion for microkernels finished in the early 90s. But no, these people never die. They never go away. They always want their microkernels. I think the GNU herd people, they, how long have been at it? They never give up. Well, okay, fine. If they have fun, good. Uh, well, is Plan 9 a microkernel? Well, I know a microkernel sellout which thinks it's a microkernel. Well, I don't know, and I don't care. Uh, in Plan 9, Everything are file systems, and file systems can be in user space. So you can have many drivers in user space, uh, but not all, because in some cases it just makes more sense to put it in the kernel because it makes things so much easier. Um, the IP stack, for example, has been both inside and outside the kernel and has moved as people have found it convenient. Uh, the applications don't care because it's just 
a file system, and they are going to talk to it in the same way, no matter if it's in the kernel, outside the kernel, uh, in the other side of the world, it's always going to talk to it through 9P. So uh, the, the concept of microkernel in Plan 9 doesn't make that much sense. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, it's a monolithic kernel because it does uh, many, mo most of the drivers are in the kernel, but well, it's because they are much easier to write in the kernel. So I don't know why people worry so much about that. Uh, but well, um, and so I was saying, well, you can change it later anyway if you really wanted to put it in user space. The applications don't care if it's user space. Uh, so the idea is to be pragmatic, not, oh, everything should be outside the kernel, and then we have Mach, which is pretty bigger than our kernel. Uh, and uh, I don't see the point. Uh, okay, well, now this is the user interface. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has seen an ASR33. I haven't. Uh, well, I think I saw one in a museum or in an ex exhibition. But if you look at your X term, uh, there is still designed to mostly work like this. Uh, otherwise, you just run STTY, uh, STTY and tell me why your X term has a baud rate. And how it defines the baud rate of your X term. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but well, maybe somebody can explain to me later. Uh, well, uh, ah, by the way, uh, the, the, the real window system, it's just throws away all that, just starts from scratch with a much simpler model. Uh, and it's designed to use a mouse, which I don't have, and uh, well, you see, it has some disadvantages. Uh, well, actually, there is also input device with pen and so on because it's ported to the EPAC, and then they wrote some uh, pointing device input and so on, and a bunch of other stuff. But anyway, uh, but you really want to use a three-button mouse uh, because there, it's really designed to, to take advantage of it. All text everywhere is editable. It's a graphical interface, but it's textual interface because it takes this idea of Unix that everything should be text and that you should be able to manipulate it easily. Uh, that has another advantage because everything is text and everything is UTF-8. Uh, it can work over the network. You don't have to worry about byte ending and, and, and that kind of a stuff because, well, it's going to be text and UTF-8 uh, doesn't care about byte and DNS. Uh, by the way, UTF-8 was invented by Ken Thompson for Plan 9 in 1992, and uh, well, Plan 9, the whole system was ported to UDF-8 everywhere in, uh, if I remember correctly, three days by Rob Pike and Ken Thompson. And well, last I tried in Unix, it doesn't seem to work very well. I don't understand why. Uh, it's only taken them like 15 years. Uh, so the Windows system multiplexes the interface that it gets uh, from the kernel itself. Mm. Maybe I have time to demo. Maybe I have to go a bit faster. ACME is the uh, user interface, what Rob Pike called user interface for, pro for programmers, let you manage lots of windows, do all kinds of weird stuff. If I have time, I will. Uh, you can write all kinds of applications. You interact with it through a file system interface too. There's a wiki browser with it. There's an email, email client and a bunch of other things. Plumbing is what I was showing before. You can plumb any. Uh, anything and it will, it's a, it's a set of rules uh, which based on regular expressions and if you send it a string, it will, it has a set of ports which are also files and applications that can handle that, that file will listen to the right port. So for example, there is a, uh, let's say URL port and then the web browser will attach there and anything you plumb, it will say, oh, this looks like a URL, I send it this way uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, Okay, the compilers. They are cross compilers, compilers. Uh, all compiling and cross compiling is the same in Plan 9. You have a different binary, compiler binary for, diff for each architecture. There are a few there. I think there is a few more, but I cannot remember them from memory. Um, very few lines of code. It compiles really fast. Uh, it's quite reliable, especially compared with other compilers. And, uh, I, well, it's pretty small. Um, it has a very simplified preprocessor because, well, I think most people will agree that the C preprocessor was one of the biggest mistakes in C, which lets people do some pretty bobinable stuff. No inline assembler, of course. Uh, the assembler, there is very little assembler in Plan 9, mostly for portability. We try to keep the amount of assembler as low as possible. 
uh, just in a few localized files, because otherwise people just think, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I add a bit here, a bit there, a bit, bit everywhere. And then you try to port it, and it's total hell, uh, or debug it, or whatever. Uh, and it has some small extensions, which I think I don't have time to explain here. Uh, ACID, ACID is a, the debugger is actually a programming language, uh, interpreted programming language. Um, that helps with portability because uh, the debugger, only a small part of the debugger has to be ported, and it interacts over slash proc with the kernel. So you can debug remotely exactly the same as you debug locally. If somebody has a bug, they can just export the uh, Mm, the directory for the process that crashed or that has a problem, and you can attach it remotely uh, exactly the same as you could, will attach it uh, locally. That helps a lot for uh, embedded systems and so on. You can also take a snap. Uh, there is no core dumps. Uh, what you do is you make sort of a tarball of the proc directory, and then you can just reinstantiate it later. Uh, so that's quite handy for debugging. Okay, networking. I guess that. Many of you here has written all this before. Uh, this is how you open a network connection with sockets. Uh, pretty fun. And you have to try like three different things just in case the user puts uh, IP or a name or whatever. And uh, of course, it only works for a certain kind of addresses. So if you go to IPv6, this will not work. And well, some more just in case. Uh, yeah, just in case the, what was the, yeah, if uh, the name resolution doesn't work, then you have to do it, but blah, blah. It's tedious, it's clunky, and it's used too many things specific to the protocol uh, uh, are stacked there. And well, if you want to do it, you have to grab it, or you need bindings for another language and so on. Well, in plan nine, we have a single library call, of course, no syscall, because all networking is done over uh, the file system, and uh, it just takes a string, uh, which mm, it's converted in, well, I, huh. and the thing is that this is a bit, it takes a bit more to explain, but it's actually very simple, and all applications do this. So when the system was ported to IPv6, no applications had to be changed at all. In Unix, oh, every application had to be changed to be able to handle IPv6, and it's just a total pain in the ass. Uh, here, everything, all the details about the protocol is abstracted. You get a connection, and you can read and write from it. That's all you care, anyway. Um, how is this done? Uh, you have a SlashNet file system. Uh, a SlashNet has, it's, it's a union mount of various file systems. The TCP IP file system, uh, which provides TCP, UDP, the Ethernet device, which provides slash Ether device number, the DNS solver, and the CS. Um, it's called the connection server. What you do is you write to a slash net CS the connection string. The connection string is just an address which, of what machine you want to connect to. And uh, the connection server will say, well, there is a, uh, huh. there is a, a network database which uh, organize, um, it replaces DNS in plan and environments. But you can ignore that because if you don't use that, it's not a problem. It will then try to resolve it via DNS. But it will figure out uh, what kind of uh, connection it is. If it's an IPv6 address, it will know, oh, this is an IPv6 uh, address. And it will do all the work that needs to be done to, um, to open a connection. And it will give you a string. That a string is a string you have to open. And when you open that file, you will get uh, the, a file to a directory where you have a data file and you can read and write. All that is encapsulated in this uh, dial uh, syscall. Uh, well, no, it's not a syscall, of course. It's a, just a library call. Um, okay, what advantages does this have? Because as last night, it's a file system. You can just import it from your gateway, and you don't need NAT. There is no other uh, translation involved. You just uh, are using directly uh, the IP stack of the uh, gateway uh, from your local machine. That also can be used to access the sort of BPM. Oh, okay. Uh, and, um, well, that, I could go on with that, but, uh, okay, Fossil and Venti. This is the file storage, more traditional file storage. And uh, this gives you automatically daily snapshots of the whole, of the whole system. Uh, if you want to see how was the state of a file yesterday, you use, use history. That will check in its last 
and slash dump uh, um, how the file system looked like, uh, well, the storage file system, of course, uh, yesterday. All the storage is done in a Venti server. Venti server is a hash address block storage. Mm, and on top of that, there is the fossil file system, which uses that to build daily snapshots of the whole system. But because all duplicated uh, data is uh, addressed by the same hash, uh, it just goes away. So you can take daily snapshots with very little uh, storage cost. And here there are two small examples of uh, history dash uh, D will make a diff, an interactive diff of all the versions, all the existing versions of admin users. And you can see all the uh, changes to the user database that have been done uh, in that system over time. Uh, okay, security. Uh, there is no root, there is no SUID. Uh, well, you can escalate privileges if uh, there are no main privileges. Uh, Namespaces also provide very good isolation. I have seen lots of people that think two root is really safe. Well, it's not. Uh, anybody that knows a bit about security, it's pretty easy to get out of two root. And uh, in, in Plan 9, no, because once you are in, inside a namespace, if you don't provide a file descriptor to mount other namespace, or you can even disable the mount syscall uh, when you call fork, and uh, well, then you will not be able to mount anything else. If you run your uh, web server like that, there will be no way they can get out of that. And then authentication and encryption. Uh, it's all handled in a file server, uh, which provides this uh, authentication file descriptor, which I mentioned before in the mount syscall. You get it from the factotum, which centralizes all authentication and keeps track of your keys without the application being able to see it. So if it's public key authentication, even if the application is compromised, your keys don't get compromised. Uh, this also it will make a whole presentation of its own. Um, concurrency. Uh, there is no p threads. Yeah, okay, I have to finish. Uh, there is no p threads. Uh, uh, concurrency is handling with uh, communication sequential processes. This is all very interesting, but you will have to go to using csp.com. There is the free online PDF book there. It's very, very uh, nice way to handle concurrency, much better than uh, p-threads and so on. Inferno, uh, it's a whole other system. Uh, you can, okay, the planning community. Uh, well, the planning community is that. It's not very friendly, but uh, I think, well, it's not a matter of being friendly. It's a matter of, well, if you're interested, I think you, there's a lot you will learn. And if you ask intelligent questions, you will get intelligent answers most of the time. Uh, maybe you have to try again, or maybe you have to look at the source code. Uh, but well, the source code is pretty simple and easy to read, so uh, I think it's worth it. And well, I took this, this, I guess many of you have seen it. I used to say Unix, and then it used to say computer. But uh, the guy looks a bit like Ken Thompson anyway, so. Uh, it applies to Plan 9, too. Uh, conclusions. Uh, plan 9 shares some things, some ideas, and some philosophy with Unix. But it's very, very different. And everything works in very different ways. Uh, so don't go to Plan 9 expecting to see the same as you have seen in Unix. Uh, but still, I think, I mean, if you are never going to use Plan 9 because it's so different and because, uh, well, maybe you really have to use IMAX, I really will try Acme. I, many people that like CMX have tried Acme. I used to use VI, and now I love Acme. Use the mouse all the time, and it works great. Just get, it takes a little while to get used to it, but give it a chance. Uh, still, if you just go and read the papers, lots of the problems that Unix systems have tried to solve over the last 30 years, Plan 9 people has looked into them. They created Unix. They have thought of what's the simplest and cl most clear way to solve these problems. Look at the papers. Most of the papers have a section near the end. How can these ideas be applied to Unix? Check it out. Maybe there is something that you can uh, learn about it and that you can apply to your day-to-day uh, -day work. And uh, well, here there are some resources to, that you can check out uh, for, for extra information and so on. And that's everything. Is there a time for a question? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see if it works. Uh, well, questions? There are no questions?
Or I don't have time for questions? Or? Just while the next speaker is setting up, because you started late. So you have yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. Did you want to get a survival kit? Uh, no, I don't. No, maybe 